From an undisclosable location for reasons of security and therefore a certain element of insecurity, this is Coast to Coast AM. Sitting in for Mr. George Nori tonight, it is I, Wells, John B. Wells, and I am delighted to be with you tonight. I'll tell you, there is so much going on that's enough to make one's head burst. I didn't want to say make my head explode because that's what everybody says. The oil thing and what's going on in the Middle East is um, pretty much top of mind with everybody. And we'll get into all of that, that's for sure. And then in the first hour and also the second hour, Lindsey Williams, pastor, preacher, chaplain, 28 years serving as chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. He firmly believes that whoever controls energy controls the economy. We agree, don't we? And uh, he is going to share some insights that um, I think you will find riveting. Here's a couple of things on a slightly lighter note. This is fun and sort of, uh, well, I don't know. It it might not be all that well. You be the judge. A three-year-old has been discovered, an Ice Age child discovered on the continent, according to the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Archaeologists have discovered the remains in a fire pit in an abandoned living area from 13,200 years ago and dated the child's death through about 11,500 years ago. Talk about a long-term mortgage. This is according to research by UAF's Ben Potter and his team in today's edition of the Journal of Science. Now, the thing that is really strange is that even that long ago, it's difficult to, uh, to attempt to get inside the heads of the ancient humans, but Potter thinks the circumstances of the child's burial and the subsequent abandoning of the living area points to the emotions of the house's inhabitants. He said, I do think that a reasonable interpretation of that would be that they cared for the child and the child was important to them. The way I do archaeology, I think of what I would want if my child was excavated in the future. 10,000 years from now, and respectful, considerate actions by scientists and everyone I think would be what I would want. In this, the Native community and the scientists were in agreement that we want to continue the respect that we have for the remains and the fact that this was a child that someone loved. And he intends to have his um, own DNA compared to the remains because uh, though the remains were cremated, researchers think the DNA might still be present in them. You may have heard this already, but if you haven't, this is uh, interesting. A scientist uh, has been killed by plague, and this reveals the vulnerability to lab strains. University of Chicago infectious disease specialist Ken Alexander still remembers the shock he felt almost 18 months ago when his pager shook with the message that a colleague had died from the plague. To cut a long story short, they hobbled this virus, but it didn't hobble it enough. And... um It shows that no matter how a germ has been hobbled, some people may always be vulnerable. So let's hope as we continue to arrange for the retrieval of safe transportation back to Earth of various viruses and bacterium uh, from celestial bodies, we will bear that in mind. Now, on to the oil thing. I've heard people say many times, as have you, that we're just in the Middle East for the oil. That's why the military is in the Middle East is for the oil. But I wonder, other than the gasoline we put in our cars, if people realize how much... We make from oil, apart from liquefied petroleum gas, gasoline, diesel fuel, kerosene, jet fuel, and fuel oils, lubricants, motor oils, and greases. There's also wax, the packaging of of frozen foods, asphalt, petroleum, coke, aromatic petrochemicals, fabrics, dyes, inks. It's, It's bad. That is, our reliance on it is bad, and what I think we should do right away is get to Chaplain Lindsey Williams and talk about exactly what's going on and how much bigger it's liable to get. Probably should strap in pretty tight, because here it comes. This is Coast to Coast AM. Without further ado, let's bring into the global living room Chaplain Lindsey Williams, for some insights and some reassurances and some uh, overall edification. Are you there, my friend? John, it is a privilege to be on Coast to Coast tonight. Well, it's a privilege to have you here, and, and frankly, we, we share the same feeling. I'll, I'll tell you what, this whole thing is, is just escalating to that point. I'm still searching for the term where things evolve to a point where they can't evolve anymore, and then they just fall down. So 
Tell us a little bit about the background and, and the unique circumstances that led to your uh, access to this extraordinary information that you're going to share with us tonight. Well, many years ago, I went to Alaska as an aviation missionary. Just after arriving in the state, I heard they were going to build a Trans-Alaska oil pipeline from America's huge oil field up on the Arctic Ocean at Prudhoe Bay. They said that 25,000 pipeliners were going to converge on our state to build that 800-mile-long, four-foot diameter pipeline. And the first thing that came to my mind was 25,000 of the roughest, toughest, cussingest, drinkingest, orneriest folks in the world. Uh, they must need some spiritual guidance. So I went to the Alaska Pipeline Service Company, which was a consortium of nine major oil companies that were going to build the biggest pipe ever constructed on the face of the earth for the carrying of crude oil at that time. And I said, don't you need a chaplain on the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline? At first, they laughed at me. <laughs> they said, we don't know what to do with a chaplain. Never had one before. Well, I kept going back and back. I guess persistence paid off. And finally, they said, okay, we'll give you the Prudhoe Bay area where the big oil field is. And the seven work camps down from that, just go up there and see what you can do. Uh, I'm quite sure they thought I wouldn't stay very long, but I did. And six months later, they came to me and said, Chaplain, we never knew the value of a chaplain on a pipeline before. You're saving us thousands of dollars of counseling fees that we aren't having to pay. We would like to offer you executive status. I said, well, uh, what, what does that mean? He said, go any place you'd like, see anything you'd like to see stay in executive dorms when you're at Prudhoe Bay, and they said, we would like to invite you to sit in on our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. Right. And I, I had not the slightest idea of what I was getting into. For three years' time, I lived with the people that you hear about in the World Bank, the IMF, the top oil company officials of the world. It changed my life because... Prior to that, I had been a pastor of a church for 12 years. i have been a missionary in Alaska for a while. And all of a sudden, I'm thrown into the midst of a den of thieves, the most corrupt people I'd ever come across in my life. And I, I, I was dumbfounded that such people could even have the audacity to do what they did. If someone had asked me before I went to the pipeline, Chaplain Williams, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world? I would have laughed at them. After three years of living with these people, sitting across the dinner table from them, talking to them, not in my church, but on their oil field, if someone had said, do you believe there's a group of people who tell the president what to do, dictate to Congress what bills to pass, and tell OPEC on any given day what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil, I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it, John. Good grief. Well, my father told me many years ago, and, and of course, it, it had credence with me because it was coming from my dad. But he said, you know, the president has a meeting with some people. They they go into office glowing. But after that meeting, they're never the same. And they look visibly aged after this meeting. Don't know who the meeting is with, but it occurs. So who are they? I would like to say very emphatically, as a man who has been a minister of the gospel for over 50 years, I say as honestly as I can, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. Now, I would never have believed that until I had lived with them. But if there's any doubt in anyone's mind out there in Coast to Coast AM this morning about the existence of these people, let me say emphatically, I lived with them for three years. I talked with them. And over these past 35 years, there were two of these individuals who I think more or less, John, out of respect for the fact that I gave three years of my life to be the chaplain to these people, I think probably that's the reason they kept in touch with me, and I was able to contact with them on, on a regular basis. They have told me things over these 35 years. Every time they have ever said anything to me, it has never failed to happen exactly as they said it. And sometimes they would tell me things that were going to happen two and three years in advance. And never has it failed to happen because behind closed doors they had planned it. So let me say that nothing ever happens in politics or in Washington or in monetary affairs, but that it was planned first by the elite of the world who know exactly what they're doing. Uh, an illustration of this was about 
five months before the Egyptian crisis in the Middle East. Uh, I was told on the phone by one of these individuals one day that there was going to be a crisis in the Middle East. Well, all of us had thought that crisis was going to be with Iran, and I asked him the question outright, is this going to be a war with Iran? He would not reply. I said, well, would you tell me where it's going to be? He wouldn't say. I did not know it was going to be Egypt, but I knew it was going to happen. I went on radio shows all over America, and, and I said to people, there is going to be a crisis in the Middle East within four to five months, and in exactly four months, it broke out in Egypt. Now, I know where this is going. They have told me. I know exactly what's going to happen to the oil in the Middle East. And basically, before one of these gentlemen died just recently, I can use his name now, so it's uh, no secret whatsoever. I know last time I was on Coast to Coast, uh, the talk show host tried his best to get me to give the name of this man. I couldn't out of respect for him. But he passed away a few months ago. His name is Mr. Ken Fromm. And, and I remember that one day he said to me, he was in his 80s, and he said, Chaplain, I'm too old to care. Just tell him everything. And he basically, before he passed away, told me everything that the elite planned to do from now through the year 2012, John. <laughs> Well, does this uh, – let me ask you this. These people who um, who you were in contact with, rumors and um, and really some of the rumors were substantiated by eyewitnesses, various uh, – oh, even the meditation room at the United Nations, for example. I mean, how <clears> – <throat> obviously, the, these confessions and, and some of the things that were told to you, that were these confessed to you out of a, a matter of conscience for these people? Because I understand that a number of them are, are very much into all these various – well, occult things, which which really occult only means secret or hidden, but do you find that there's an, an occult nature to their overall behavior, or is it just straight-up ruthless business dealings? Well, both. Uh, many of them are involved in the occult. There are others who were fairly decent people. Um, in fact, I, I never saw one of them drunk. I saw very few of them ever smoking a cigarette. I mean, really, they were fairly clean living people. But there's one thing that stood out with all of them, and that is the name of the game is control. So I began to analyze these people the best I could. Now, keep in mind, I have a bachelor's degree. I graduated from uh, a university, and I had studied psychiatry. I had been a pastor of a church for 12 years. I dealt with many, many people in many different levels and had an opportunity to know how to somewhat analyze people. And I found out that these elite of the world, they do have a code of ethics. Now, it's quite different than the code of ethics that you and I would have, who are people who believe in morals and decency and right. I was brought up as a child in a wonderful Christian home. My parents told me to t- taught me to teach the tr- tell the truth. And But I found that the code of ethics that the elite have, for instance, one facet of their code of ethics is they are required to tell the world everything they're going to do before they do it. Now, the only problem is the average person does not know how to interpret what they're saying. For instance, many years ago when Daddy Bush, uh, well, president many years ago, when he first used the expression, new world order, I didn't know what he was talking about. He used it a lot, though, over 100 times, I think, when he was in office. Yes. And oftentimes he would use the expression, a thousand points of light. Did he know what he was talking about? He sure did. But when I talked with these people and found out just what they meant by what they said, they were telling the world what they were going to do. So in their code of ethics, part of it is we must tell the world everything we're going to do before we do it. Now, their perversion is Hollywood. I say this very emphatically. I've in talking with them many, many times, and uh, their method of telling the world what they're going to do is the liberal media. Uh, their perversions, Hollywood, and their mouthpiece is the liberal media. If you listen to it, you'll find out sometimes if you know how to listen to their buzzwords, you'll be able to figure out what they're saying, John. Well, it seems that people will, I, I heard it once said, that people will reveal their bad intentions 
uh, to you if you'll just allow yourself to hear it. And, uh, yes. uh, no, carry on. Yeah, they will. Uh, for instance, many expressions that have been given to me. I was on the phone with one of these individuals one day, and he kept using the expression, after two years, after two years, and I was so fascinated by what he was saying, and I knew he had never told me anything before that it wasn't going to happen just like he said it. He said to one day, and this was about uh, two, two and a half years ago, he said, within two years, you will not recognize America. Again, in the course of the conversation, and I'll quote him verbatim, after two years, you will be so poor, you will not be able to do anything about it. At another point in the conversation, he said, by the end of 2012, the dollar will be dead. He did not say the dollar was going to cease to exist. He merely said the dollar will be dead. And there's one thing that people need to learn in listening to the elite, and that is listen intently to what they're saying and don't try to add to it. Just Take it as it was. For instance, this expression, by the end of 2012, the dollar will be dead. He did not say non-existent. That means that it will be so worthless that, as they said at another point to me, they said, now, the grocery store shelves in America will never be empty. They said in the new world order, we can always supply groceries for the grocery store shelf. If there's a problem in Florida, they have a big freeze, we just bring it in from somewhere else in the world. If California has an earthquake, we haul it in from someplace else in the, in the world. They said, Chaplin, you never have to worry about the grocery store shelves being empty. Now, I know this is quite different, but I have to tell you exactly what's been said. So I give it to you as it is. And then you can take it and do with it as you wish. But he said, the grocery store shelves will never be empty. But he said, Chaplin, you may go hungry. And I said, what do you mean? That doesn't sound right. I said, try to elaborate. He said, the currency is going to become so worthless, the dollar, by the end of 2012, that even though the grocery store shelves are full, you may go lacking for food, John. Well, that sounds like the old Weimar Germany, the, uh, the big depression they had in their 20s. Yes. Now, keep in mind that three years ago, we had a drop in crude oil prices from $147 a barrel to $50 a barrel. I was told uh, three months before it happened that it was going to happen. And I went on radio talk shows all over America. Some talk show hosts wouldn't even let me go on their show. Uh, they said, you're crazy. They said, it can't happen. Uh, everybody in the futures market for oil was predicting it was going to $200 a barrel. Now, you'll remember this very well three years ago. Think back, put on your thinking cap. And uh, this gentleman told me, he said, Chaplin, the price of crude oil uh, approximately two to three months from now is going to go from $147 a barrel, where it was at the time, to $50 a barrel. I dared to risk my reputation, warn the American people, or give them some hope, really, and say it's going from – $147 a barrel to $50 a barrel. You'd be paying a dollar and fifty cents a gallon at the gas pump. I was laughed at. There were talk shows that literally laughed at me. One Wall Street analyst was on a show with me one day, and he said, Chaplin, quit this. He said, you shouldn't say things like that. Don't you know this is going to impact the world to a point that, God, please, don't keep saying things like this. I said, sir. It is going to $50 a barrel. It actually went to $43 a barrel, as some of you will remember, and it went to $1.50 a gallon at the gas pump. And at the time, I was told, and this is recorded in uh, on many radio stations across America. You can find it in the archives, and you'll also find it in my six-DVD set that I made about a year, year and a half ago, everything the elite told me for the past two years. And I said, I was told that the price of crude oil is going to stay, and I gave the exact time because they gave it to me, it's going to stay at approximately 50 to $70 a barrel for two and one half years. It did, exactly as they had told me. It then began to go up, and I told folks, I said, it's going to go back up, and I'll tell you where it's going. Within the next 9 to 12 months, I have been told that the price of crude oil is going to go from 150 to 200 dollars a barrel. Now, you're talking about the currency. Let's put it this way: 
A gallon of gasoline today still costs the same thing it did three years ago when it went to a dollar and fifty cents a gallon. You say, no, uh, uh, no, Pastor, it, you, a Chaplain, I just went to the gas pump and I'm paying over three dollars for it. No, you aren't. No, watch this now. Four quarts to a gallon. Oh yes, I'll tell you what. We're about to uh, come up on a hard break. In for George Norrie. This is John Wells, and I want to know, are, who are these people? Are they Europeans? Are they multinationals? Is it one small group? They're obviously uh, unicultural. And then, how long until the real fall, and how long will that fall last? And what's on the other side of it? We're speaking with Chaplain Lindsey Williams on Coast to Coast AM. Please stand by. Thank you, my invisible friend. Well... So unlike the Great Depression of the 30s, where the money had value, but there just wasn't any, according to the chaplain, Lindsay Williams, our guest tonight, this time the money is going to be worth very little. And so then it follows with all of these things that we make from our oil, from wherever it comes from, what are we going to do about that? They're already paying $9 a gallon in London right now. With the price of oil just slightly over $100 a barrel, what happens if it goes to 250 I want to know, and I know you do too, so please stay with us. Our guest tonight, Chaplain Lindsey Williams, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Back together again with Lindsey Williams. Well, before we needed to break, which we have to do, uh, you were talking about a quart is still a quart and a gallon is still a gallon, and uh, 50 Bucks a barrel is all we're paying, but the problem is the money's not worth anything, so it's going to turn to two fifty. Is that pretty much it? The gasoline is not what has changed price. You're right. still paying the same thing for a gallon of gasoline today that you did when it was a dollar and fifty cents a gallon at the gas pump. Four quarts is still a gallon. One ounce of gold is still one ounce of gold. What are you paying for that four quarts of gasoline today? You're paying $3 a gallon. It was not the the gasoline that changed. It was the currency that you are purchasing the gasoline with, which has been debased, destroyed through the Federal Reserve and the national debt. And today, nobody wants our T-bills. Again, that ounce of gold that back when I was told Three years ago, and I went on radio stations all over America, and I said to people, I have just been told, and I do not sell gold, by the way. You couldn't buy an ounce from me if you tried, and I'm not here to recommend any dealers. I'm telling you exactly what they told me. About three years ago, I was utterly at my wit's end, and I said to this individual as he and I were talking on the phone, I said, how can I spare my household? I said, in light of what you're telling me is going to happen, uh, I would have helped my children and my wife to be safe. He said, Chaplain, there is only one place that you can maintain your purchasing power. I said, what is that? He said, that's our currency. I said, what do you mean, your currency? He said, we don't trust paper. He said, if it's a piece of paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. And that includes Federal Reserve notes, by the way, and your 401K and your retirement fund and your hospitalization and uh, whatever it may be that you're trusting in, your insurance policy. He said, Chaplain, our currency – I said, what is it? He said, our currency is gold and silver. And three years ago, when you could have bought an ounce of gold for $700 an ounce and silver for $15 an ounce – I begged people. I said, I have just been told by the elite that the only thing that is going to maintain a purchasing power is gold and silver. Go buy every ounce of it you can get. Many people now are saying, oh, chaplain, why didn't we listen to you? I told you. The elite told me. I begged you. And the same thing right now. I know what's going to happen through 2012. There is this, by the way, may I say again, uh, the few emphatic things that I must say tonight, this positively is not a conspiracy. I don't believe in conspiracies. I believe that this is an agenda of a group of elite people on the face of the earth who have the power to be able to manipulate currencies, control presidents, tell OPEC what they'll give them for a gallon, a barrel of oil on any given day, and every bit of it planned behind closed doors. And what we have to look forward to You can save your household from difficulty if you will listen to what the elite 
a saying and do something about it. Uh, a person asked me the other day, okay, you say buy gold. I can't eat it. Uh, what am I going to do whenever the dollar crashes? Well, what good is that gold going to do me? I'll tell you what, it, what good it will do you, according to what the elite have told me. They said, Chaplain, by the time the end of 2012 comes around and the dollar has become so worthless, they said gold will be 3000 Three thirty-five hundred dollars an ounce. They said, "Take that gold if you want." To. And they said this mainly to me out of respect because they saw how desperate I was to prepare for my own household. And they said, "Take that gold then and buy whatever currency is available at the time." And they said, "You still have the same purchasing power that you have today, John." This thing that's happening over in the Middle East now, with with these with these countries falling one domino after another. Who's next? Saudi Arabia? Uh, <laughs> I wish you had not asked that so direct, but I will give you an answer. The Muslim Brotherhood has planned, and you'll, you'll pick this up on the Internet, and by the way, you can watch it for yourself and see it happen. The Muslim Brotherhood has planned on March the 11th a day of rage in Saudi Arabia. It's scary. I'm very concerned. Because when the crisis broke out in the Middle East, uh, I immediately went to my friends and I said, what in the world is going on? Well, they let me know, hey, we told you this four or five months ago. I said, yes, I said it on radio shows all over America. And then when it happened, people called me up on the phone and said, Chaplain Williams, you're a prophet. And I said, no, I'm not a prophet. Let me say very emphatically to your audience right now on Coast to Coast AM, I am not a prophet. I merely know the people who are doing it. They give me the information. I give it to you. I didn't get this from any divine source uh, or any other source. I got it from the elite who are by an agenda doing what they're doing. And they said, okay, uh, this is what's going to happen. The Middle East is going to continue to break out in more and more situations like you saw in Egypt, like you're seeing in Libya right now. It will spread from country to country. There is a reason why they're doing this. The king of Saudi Arabia three days ago flew back from his penthouse in England to Saudi Arabia. They're doing everything in their power to give the people anything they want in order to keep them quiet, but it won't last. I have been told that this is going to spread from country to country. Many of the kings will be deposed. There will be some very unusual things take place over there. But, John, every bit of this is for a reason. Now, whether the audience really wants to know that reason or not uh, is questionable, but it, it is being done for a reason, and there is an end to all of the things that they're going to do. Let me ask you something. How much exposure to your own personal security are you taking by revealing this information? I mean, we're, we're over here. We're on the bird. We're all over the world. We're the hundreds of, of, uh, of affiliates, bless you all, have, uh, have carried this show for many years, and uh, new ones are being added all the time. How dangerous is it for you to be talking about this? Over the past 35 years, I have been threatened two times. Um, I was called in once and told that I should not say certain things again. Uh, I had plenty of other things that I could say, so I continued saying those. Um, Three years ago, again, I was called. And the person on the other end of the line, whom I knew well, I spent hours and hours with him, uh, he was angry. Oh, he was upset. He said, Chaplain, you have said too much. You've gone too far. You cannot say certain things anymore. And he said, if you do this and this and this anymore, we are going to do this and this and this. Uh, I thought back on John F. Kennedy. He was president of the United States of America. He tried to cross these people. And you know what happened to him. And I knew that I, a little bitty unknown down here, uh, just a, a chaplain on the pipeline, if they did that to John F. Kennedy, they'd have no problem with me at all. So I asked him. I said, well, okay. What do you want me to do? They said, first of all, you've got to close your website. Now, John, websites cost a lot of money, and I didn't want to close my website. I had a beautiful one. It was lwoil.com back in those days. And he said, you've got to close your website. You're saying too much. And he said, secondly, there are certain things in your DVD that you've got to take out. I said, I'll be more than happy to, but I said, can I continue? 
to say certain things? He said, yes, don't mind at all. But he said, there are certain things you can't say. So two times in these 35 years, I have been threatened. Uh, I'm still here alive. I agreed to do what they said. I figured it was better to be able to say some things that could help people than to be able to say nothing. So as a result, I went along with some of the things that they asked me to do, John. Understood. Understood well. You know, going back to that whole, uh, well, I was about to be flipping and say, well, it's <clears throat> it's quicker than some other ways one can go since we're all headed that way. Anyway, um, well, this is really huge. So, and there's, uh, you know, I can't possibly know as much about what you've learned as you do, and we only have two hours together, but but we have the majority of that time left, so let's uh, let's just keep rolling. So what action are foreign countries taking because of the falling dollar and the uh, increasing price of the crude? What, what is, if we're taking the beating on this end that, that we're at least at this point somewhat aware of, what's going to happen to them and what will their reaction be to it? Well, I will answer that question. Let me answer it by a number of statements. First of all, uh, and please, I hope everyone out in the audience will write this down. And also, I'm going to give some dates tonight. I want you to write those dates down on a piece of paper. Uh, put them beside your calendar. And every time one of them takes place, uh, I want you to mark it off. Don't dare say Lindsey Williams is a prophet. Take my word for it that I got this from the people who are doing it. And then you can go from there and be honest about it. First of all, the standard currency of the world is crude oil. This is so important. I was told this numbers of years ago by one of these individuals. He said it is not the dollar. It's not the yen. It's not the pound. It's not the one. It's not the ruble. He said the standard currency of the world is crude oil. And whatever crude oil is traded in will be the reserve currency of the world. The dollar has been that. For many, many years, it is losing its status because just recently, Russia and China entered into an agreement. Russia, by the way, as of last year, became the number one supplier of crude oil on the face of the earth, uh, bypassing Saudi Arabia. The reason they did was because of their super deep wells, which they drilled down to 42,000 and some odd feet a number of years ago and found massive amounts of crude oil. They did not find fossil oil. They found abiotic oil. And they're having to rewrite the textbooks now because this oil is seeping up into the upper oil fields. Now, Russia made an agreement with China, and they said, we will supply you with all of the crude oil and natural gas that you want. Therefore, through this entire situation, and folks, this is so important, China will not be affected by what's happening today in the Middle East and what's going to happen. China will not in the least be affected because they're getting their oil from Russia. But Russia and China made an agreement that Russia would supply China the oil and the natural gas, but they would not do it in the American dollar. And for the first time, the dollar, a crack, came in the fact that it was the reserve currency of the world. Now, if you'd like, John, I'll give you a history of this. You say that we've got... Uh, you know, another hour and maybe 10 minutes, I think I can at least cover basically everything that's going to happen between now and the end of 2012, give you dates and some background to this. Uh, But keep in mind that the standard currency of the world is crude oil, and I was told, watch the price of crude oil, and you will know the progression of the elite program. Please write this down. Watch the price of crude oil, and you will know the progression of the elite's program. The elite's program is the new world order, and you can tell just where they are in fulfilling what they're going to do between now and the end of 2012 as you see the price of that crude oil go up. And it will go up to $150 to $200 a barrel, probably closer to $200 a barrel, and there's a reason why they're carrying it there. Very interesting. I've theorized for a long time that the reason that we're in the um, in the Middle East is to maybe a sort of a buffer to keep some other interests out of the Middle East. I don't I don't know how uh, valid that that little hypothesis is, but uh, I've often wondered if uh, the Russians tried to go into the Middle East, they went in, into Afghanistan, and certainly if they'd been successful there, well, maybe uh, Iran and Iraq might have been on the 
might have been on, on their crosshair in their crosshairs. But I'm curious: Do you think that uh, our presence over there has anything to do with keeping the Chinese out? The reason we were in Iraq, it was an oil war. Uh, I think at this point, the questions can only be answered if I go back and give just a little history. Uh, allow me, if you will, for a moment. Well, please, I started it with these obtuse questions, so just roll with it. Uh, in 1901, and I hope everyone out there in the audience is taking notes, in 1901, in Beaumont, Texas, was the first major oil strike basically in the world. It was called Spindle Top. It went up about 200 feet, blew the pipe out of the ground, and at that point, the major oil companies of today were formed, Texaco, Shell, Standard Oil, and Chevron. That's where they had the beginning. In 1903, Henry Ford uh, built his first assembly line automobile in America. And in Germany, Mercedes built their first assembly line automobile. Back in those days, gasoline was 15 to 25 cents a gallon. Just after that, oil was discovered in the Middle East amongst the Arab countries. This was before OPEC was ever even thought of, somewhere over 60 years ago. And at that time, the Arab countries where oil was found was divided up amongst those oil companies, which had had their beginning back at Spindle Top, Texaco, Shell, Standard Oil, Chevron. And I, I sat one day with Mr. Fromm, and he explained all of this to me. I sat there utterly fascinated. And he said, Chaplin, the Arabs did not have the money to produce their own oil fields. They said there'd been nothing but nomads roaming the deserts riding camels for years. And all of a sudden, oil was found on their land. And he said, we divided up. And because he was one of them. He said, we divided up the Arab countries. And he said, each of us went into a different country. One country took Saudi Arabia. Another one would take another country and so on and so on. And they went in and said, we will build your oil fields. We will supply the money to do it. After all, they'd become quite well-to-do after Spindle Top. And they did. They said, but the agreement was, whenever you sell, uh, whenever we produce your oil fields and you're selling your oil, we, in turn, wish to be paid back. And they did. The Arab countries paid them back for what they had invested in their countries. But this is some agreements that practically nobody knows about. I would have never known had they not told me. At that time, they agreed that we would not produce America's oil fields. Now, this is so significant because just a little later in the program, I'm going to tell you when we are going to produce America's oil fields, and you are going to be dumbfounded when you put it down on your calendar and watch it. Now, Mr. Ken Fromm, himself personally, a young man with Atlantic Richfield, was given the job of going to the United Arab Emirates and Dubai and that area and producing the oil fields on behalf of Atlantic Richfield. Other countries, the other oil companies took on. Now, that was at the same time. This is so important that you write this down. That was the same year, 1981, that the 401Ks came into being. Oh, my goodness, it was all done for a purpose. They knew what they were doing, and they looked to the year that we are in right now, 2011, and saw and had planned what was happening. So let's go a little further. You remember that 1977 through 1981, President Carter was president of the United States of America, and his secretary of state was Mr. Henry Kissinger. Kissinger traveled abroad that year to all of the major oil-producing countries of the world, and he said, I want to cut you a deal. You know what? I would really appreciate it, and I know our audience would too, if we can just hold up right there because I really want to hear about this deal that Mr. Kissinger wanted to pitch these people because apparently they went for it. This is John Wells in for George Norrie. And our guest tonight is Chaplain Lindsey Williams. Please stand by because we're going to go down the rabbit hole a little deeper here on the other side of this break. This is Coast to Coast AM.